This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. After a year of sluggish economic growth and widespread inflation, what can we expect for 2023? Hello, I'm Mike Walter, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. 2022 was the year the world got a rude awakening from something that had largely disappeared from many countries, inflation. Just when the supply chain crisis that defined the early COVID-19 pandemic recovery started to ease, many policymakers were surprised when inflation proved stubborn instead of transitory, as the U.S. Federal Reserve had predicted. Then came the economic shock of Russia's conflict with Ukraine. Owen Faircloth looks back at a year that looked and felt a lot like the early 1980s. Across the United States, an annual ritual to snap up some of the year's hottest bargains during the holiday shopping season. But if this year's post-Thanksgiving sales lack the fervor that has occasionally turned ugly, perhaps the worldwide inflation crisis has played a part. I think it made us look for sales yeah. more so than we usually would, just to be conservative with how much we're spending. 2022 was the year inflation came roaring back as prices across much of the globe rose the most since 1981, the year Ronald Reagan became U.S. president. Pent-up consumer demand, overwhelming supply chains, and low interest rates encouraging people to spend were two factors. Inflation here in the U.S. peaked at more than 9% in June. And one reason price rises like that have been such a shock is that inflation cycles had largely disappeared from most advanced economies since the last great inflation crisis of the 1980s. So a whole generation of people have had to get to grips with the concept of rampant price rises on the fly. And for some, it's been painful. And inflation engulfed much of the global economy. Gasoline prices surging from Paris to Sao Paulo among the most visible early signs. I travel more than 25 kilometers to come to work. So yes, it's a lot of money. We have to cut down on various things to be able to shop. You can't go far. We have to use very little fuel. Those surging fuel prices were blamed largely on the conflict between Russia, one of the world's biggest crude oil producers, and Ukraine, and the ensuing Western economic sanctions imposed upon Moscow. And as two of the world's most important wheat exporters, these neighbors also drove food prices higher, especially in countries dependent upon grain imports, such as Morocco. It's true that this war has affected the prices of wheat and flour, which now is seven or eight dirhams, when it used to be five dirhams. All of this prompted economists to slash global growth forecasts that initially looked stellar as much of the world emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic. But as inflation begins to ease off, both China, where price pressures have been less pronounced, and India are expected to lead the strongest expansions in 2023. Owen Fairclough, CGTN, Washington. To discuss the global economy, let's bring in our panelists from Portland, Oregon. Jan Leong is chair professor of economics at Willamette University. From Sao Paulo, Brazil, Gilson Schwartz is a professor of economics at the University of Sao Paulo. John Gong is a professor of economics at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. He's joining us from Tel Aviv. And here in Virginia, Arthur Dong is a professor at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. Welcome all of you. Uh, Jan Leong, why don't I start with you? The global economic uh, outlook just does not look very good at all. All. Let's listen to the IMF uh, managing director. Fighting this is more complicated because of stubborn inflation. We project it to persist for longer, hopefully pick up this year, but then gradually decline through 2023. We project global, global inflation at 6.5% next year. So, Jan, let's start there. Stubborn inflation, it seems to be the, the catchphrase right now. Everyone seems concerned about it. Talk to us about it and its impact moving into 2023. Right. Great to talk to you, Mike. Um, so I think the IMF projected that this year the global inflation rate will reach 8.8 percent. And I think um, there are a lot of um, sort of speculations about what exactly caused inflation. And I think the supply side really take a, uh, played a huge role. So as we all know, the supply chain disruption earlier, um, you know, back in 2021 due to the pandemic, then with the Russia war, um, and that again aggravated, you know, energy crises and also the food crises. 
Um, so I think there's a lot to do with the supply chain, supply side factors. And in the United States, um, labor shortages and supply chain uh, disruptions. And so all of these, I think, really uh, drive that inflation. Now, there are a lot of arguments about, you know, the overstimulus packages from the United States government, for instance. Uh, but again, you know, other countries like European Union, they didn't have such a generous uh, stimulus, but yet they they are also battled with inflation. So I think, you know, sometimes I think economists maybe overplay the important role of the demand side inflation. Um, not to mention when we look at the wages, um, they're largely, you know, lagging behind inflation rate rather than, you know, filling it. Um, as a matter of fact, um, in the United States, for example, when we look at October, the real hourly earning was actually 2.8, negative 2.8 percent growth compared to last year. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of the inflationary pressures come from the supply chain, supply side. Well, you know, let me let me kind of uh, piggyback off what you just talked about. Um, we have this uh, threat of a rail strike here in the United States. Over in Europe, there's a lot of uh, talk about strikes as well. A lot of it on, about what you're talking about, like my wages are not living up to what we're seeing in terms of inflation. How much of a concern is that moving into 2023? Well, I think this is a major concern because, again, take the United States as example. Um, the third quarter growth rate right now is 2.9 percent. So many people kind of cheered about, you know, that the U.S. economy is actually not looking that bleak. Uh, but at the same time, I think, you know, with the real wage lagging, uh, what we're seeing is consumers are running their credit cards. The credit balance has gone up by 15 percent this year compared to last year. So um, that is the fastest growth in 20 years, by the way. So I think one really question is, you know, how much the U.S. consumers can continue to spend, you know, based on uh, the borrowing, right, based on debt increase. Um, so I think, you know, with that real wage, um, you know, stagnant, even decline, um, for one is we don't know how long this is going to help the economy to continue to grow. And for two, definitely people are suffering. Gilson, let's talk about uh, something else that Georgieva uh, spoke about, which is this expression polycrisis, um, where it's basically this stew that's out there that she describes as, uh, you know, interest rates going up. Uh, you've got climate change, food supply shortages, high inflation. And of course, the, the wild card, which is this pandemic, which persists. We don't know with the winter coming on if, if we're going to see a spike in cases, all of that adding to this. Is it, is it kind of a perfect storm out there? Well, we can say that the stew is boiling. Because it's really, I mean, uh, very, very controversial uh, with respect to the economic policies that are adopted. Because it looks like uh, some of the Western governments are trying to put even more boiling water into the stew. That is, adopting high policies, high interest rate policies, which will, of course, uh, restrict the potential for growth. And this very basic misunderstanding that reducing growth, that is, reducing demand, you can fight inflation. We know very well, as has already been mentioned, that it's basically mostly a supply chain problem and a global supply chain problem at that. So restricting demand, containing growth, raising interest rates, that's just, uh, you know, the, the well-known protection of uh, financial assets and, and uh, property, while, on the other hand, you are depressing wages, you are depressing employment, and that creates even more problems in terms of restoring the supply chains. And of course, there's the geopolitical challenge to actually re-globalize after some like two or three years of deglobalization due to the pandemic. Re-globalize. Re we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But uh, John Gong, I want to want to talk about this new study out from the OECD, uh, which came out not too long ago. That's the Organization for Economic Cooperation Development. They pointed to growth areas for next year, which will come largely from Asian countries. In fact, uh, they say it will contribute to uh, close to three quarters of the expansion of the global GDP. So let's talk about China and, and what it can do in terms of its economy moving into 2023? Um, well, first of all, let me point out the two countries uh, you referred to at the beginning of the program, that is uh, India and China, uh, haven't seen the kind of high inflation that we're seeing in the Western economies. Um, it's, I think it's, it's no coincidence that these are the two countries that haven't imposed uh, sanctions against Russia. Uh, they're still buying oil from Russia. Um, and other energy products. And I think that's probably, you know, the most uh, differentiating reason here. Um, it, I, it, I, the way I look at the, um, the inflation issue, I think uh, it has a lot to do with uh, the overheated demand side. It also has to do with the, 
you know, high prices associated with the most fundamental products in the economy, that is food, that is oil and energy products, and they're all related to this war in Ukraine. And I don't see how these prices can come down anytime soon. And it's, that's fundamentally driving up commodities and products for all kinds of other things. Um, and, and, you know, if you look at the, the major oil producing countries, they're not helping either. Saudi Arabia and the other OPEC member countries, they are refusing to increase production. So this is a this is a commodity price that I, I don't think they have a solution anytime soon. Now, speaking about China, I think in China, we have a, 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 a entirely different issue here. In China, it's not overheating of demand. It's demand, aggregate demand inadequacy, actually, uh, due to the you know, extended uh, zero COVID policy. Uh, people are not spending money. People can't spend money because you know they're all locked in their homes and and, and the shops are stores are you know pretty much closed until just recently. Um, and, and, I, and I hope that uh, you know we're starting to see some signs of relaxing here. Uh, there's a very good indication today from the Guangzhou municipal government that they're not requiring uh, COVID, uh, PCR tests uh, for everyone and and they're starting to open up the uh, the city. So I think um, you know, this is a very good sign here. I think. As China picks up its demand, um, there's some hope that uh, the growth in China is going to come back again. Um, and uh, that probably will provide some impetus to the global economy. Uh, Arthur, I want to get your thoughts. Uh, I've got a question for you, but I want to get your thoughts on what John said about uh, China and India, you know, uh, not getting oil from Russia. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why they're not taking it on the chin nearly as much as some of the other countries. And then also Gilson talking about how the U.S. is actually adding boiling water to the stew. I want to get your thoughts on on their comments. Yes, uh, thank you, Michael, for having me on. Uh, certainly, I do agree with John to a certain extent that uh, both China and India are beneficiaries of being able to continue to access abundant amounts of oil that are coming out of Russia, whereas the rest of the world is being starved of energy resources. Everything that we touch or consume in some way touches upon oil. And when you think about increasing inflationary food prices, if you think about the role of the farmer, well, fertilizer for most people don't really understand it's made from natural gas. And so hydrocarbons play into the fertilizer production and farmers use an enormous amount of diesel fuel in their tractors and machinery in which to harvest large amounts of food. And finally, they get the food on the table from farm to market requires a tremendous amount of energy and transportation as well. So any sort of increase in diesel costs and fuel costs will, across the board, factor into increasing food prices across the world. One of the big issues that m many countries are facing, China included, is food insecurity. And we've already heard stories emanating from different parts of the world where places like Malaysia are actually restricting the export of chickens to Singapore out of this fear that rising food prices are going to result in social unrest. And so that's one of the issues that many governments are dealing with. Now, with regard to uh, this question of whether the United States is throwing fuel on the fire, I, I would suggest the opposite. I'm in agreement that there are not many policy tools that central bankers can use in order to arrest, uh, arrest inflation. And the classical tool is simply to, to use monetary policy in order to control the interest rates, raise the cost of capital, and thereby, in a sense, you know, making it more costly for uh, consumers and industries to demand products. And if you can arrest demand in some way, all things being equal, you'll start to see a normalization in prices. Arthur, we saw uh, two quarters of economic contraction here in the United States, and then in the third quarter, we saw a jump, uh, modest, about 3 percent, um, which is a positive sign. But there's still all this talk about the potential for recession as we move into 2023. I want to get your thoughts on that. Well, if you poll the economists here in the United States, as well as Wall Street, uh, three out of four economists are, are, are almost baking in with certainty that the United States in 2023 is headed towards a recession. Now, the whole question is, will it be a soft recession or a hard landing? And I think that's the unknown question. I might take a different perspective on this, and I'll go back to Jan's uh, you know, articulation and the numbers that she presented. The United States currently is at full employment with an unemployment rate of 3.7 percent. This is historically low, and we haven't seen these kinds of numbers in decades. And so if you're thinking about the demand side in the United States, so long as people have jobs in America, 
That will continue to support demand. Real recessions occur when demand collapses and people are unemployed and they can no longer afford to spend. And so I would argue that there's a structural element here in that there is population compression in the United States. We're running out of people of working age. The baby boomer generation, such as myself, are retiring and dropping out of the workforce in large numbers. And the United States is actually headed towards a population crisis, which is only going to get worse by 2025. And so that being said, I would argue so long as companies are continuing to hire and they're not laying off in, in, in large numbers by no means, I would suggest that this recession may be a very soft one coming up. All right, Jan, uh, he mentioned hard landing. Uh, we hear so much about soft landings, and the, and the media seems to be in love with this uh, airplane analogy. But former Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke uh, talked about uh, it, you know, monetary policy when it comes to the Fed and used a vehicular uh, analogy, and, uh, and I'm going to probably paraphrase it. But he said, he famously said, if you're making monetary policy, it's like driving a car. The car basically has has you know, a foggy uh, a windshield, the, the speedometer doesn't work so well. Uh, when you hit the gas or the brakes, it takes a while for either one of them to work. In other words, it's pretty tough sledding and trying to navigate this sort of thing. So we hear so much about the soft landing. What's the likelihood of that? And is it probably going to be more like a hard landing, as and Arthur suggests? Right. So I think at this point, all these discussions about what kinds of recession we're having, I think it's really a moot point. I think for the most part, recession or not, that's just semantic. And as I mentioned earlier, when we have a real earning that is down by 2.8%, um, you know, it feels that's certainly like a recession for most of the people. Uh, now, I also wanted to pick up the point on the, 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 the labor market, right? So this idea that we somehow have a too tight labor market, and I, I understand the point most of the time when people are talking about we have this inflation and unemployment rate trade-off. It's really using this very old classical, you know, Phillips curve uh, to explain that. But, you know, we know the U.S. is facing labor shortages. 16 million people are having long COVID, and out of which 2 to 4 million million people are out of labor force because of that. So yes, we do have a labor shortages. And yes, the labor market so far has seemed to be uh, holding up. Uh, but earlier reports, I think from the ADP, uh, report that this this uh, this month uh, we have added about 129,000 job, private jobs, and that is much lower than last month. So we're still looking at you know the job reports from the BLS this Friday, and we'll get a better gauge about the labor market. But the point here is, given that the nominal wage is trailing behind the inflation, it's hard to say you know it's the too full labor market and too high wage demand that is driving uh, the inflation. Therefore, we need to use interest rate to kill the demand, so to speak. I think, you know, there are much better ways to deal with inflation by, you know, really pumping up the supply side, right? That we wanted to, you know, give better child care so that women can work. We wanted to help these uh, elderly people so then, you know, we'll have more labor force. We wanted to boost, in, uh, you know, education and so we can increase productivity and so on and so forth. Um, there is also, you know, some of the strategic, you know, price controls on, you know, for example, oil um, that I think uh, Indonesia probably can provide a, a interesting example here. Uh, but the point is a lot of these supply side inflation, uh, like the housing costs, like energy, like food, uh, are not something that you can simply uh, eliminate by raising the interest rates. Gilson, uh, Citigroup's out with this warning. They're, they're calling it a rolling uh, recession, where many countries uh, face recessions in the next year. Describe for us what 2023 looks like. What countries will you be looking at uh, as kind of a tell on, on which way the, the global economy goes? Well, for sure, the developing countries, the least developed countries, will suffer the most. That's been the pattern since the beginning of the crisis. I mean, the big crisis, we're still in it. It's a big financial crisis. Uh, it's an energetic transi transition that's not being managed globally. So I agree with the, with, the, with the rationale that oil prices are really a very tough issue that depends on geopolitical agreements. And that's the point I made before about deglobalization. Since we don't have a common horizon for prospect cooperation in global development and global coordination of macroeconomic policies, it seems to me that we are beginning to you know, lose steam with respect to structural changes that could be actually a frontier for growth and for non-inflationary growth and for sustainable growth. 
I mean that uh, we are going through a technological war. We've seen the U.S. spending billions and billions to protect their market. They are right now doing not only a, a war on, on oil or on Russia or supporting NATO's ambitions in, in, in Europe, but they're also protecting in the most, uh, most uh, primitive way, I'd say. They're protecting, they're closing their technological sector. And of course, there's a lack of a skilled workforce even to you know, keep up to that uh, state uh, promotion of uh, strategic technological industry. So I think that oil, energy, and technology, in a broad sense, are structural changes that we are going through that depend on re-globalization, depend on coordination of po economic policies. Just, you know, the usual, uh, as we say in Brazil, bean and rice policy of uh, raising interest rates and managing the short-term expectations of financial markets, that will take us nowhere. John, let's talk a little bit more about the Citigroup memo. Uh, it's singling out China. It says that China will see growth along with a few emerging markets. Uh, what are the expectations for 2023 there? Well, I, I'm holding my fingers crossed that once this zero COVID policy is gone, China's economy will come back with a vengeance. You know, people are waiting out there, you know, trying to get their home to spend money. Um, and, and I'm pretty convinced that uh, if this policy is, is totally relaxed and, and, you know, people are going to go out and, and spend money and consumption is going to come back. So I think China definitely is one of the countries that uh, will be, in my view, the bright spots, uh, one of the bright spots for for next year, um, worldwide economic growth. Now, let me also add a comment to to uh, about the U.S. economy. I think there's one issue I want to bring up that we haven't really discussed. It's it actually related to do with it is something to do with the uh, U.S. political agenda here. You know, I, I think one thing that's sort of a structurally happening here that that hasn't been uh, paid much attention to is the um, is the coming back of the U.S. Uh, manufacturing industry. Um, you know, uh, the Trump administration, the Biden administration, been talking about you know creating manufacturing jobs, corporate Americas, uh, reassuring, friend reassuring. These things, I think, starting to finally happen. Um, and if you look at that. I just give you one example. Um, not just American companies, but also uh, say you know in the semiconductor industry, it's a big thing here in the United States, right? So um, you know, look at TSMC Taiwan. I mean, they are shipping. Not shipping. They're flying. How many people back to uh, Arizona? They're, they're going to create thousands of jobs in Arizona, and it's not just uh, uh, Taiwan's TSMC. Um, in, but also European companies. Also, because of the energy prices going up in Germany, for example, these German companies are also looking uh, into foreign direct investment in the United States. So I think this is a very, very strong structural change that finally that we're starting to see. Um, manufacturing jobs coming back to the United States. I don't have any exact figures, but, uh, but my sense is that that's going to be very significant. Uh, you know, all uh, indications are uh, pointing to the fact that uh, um, we're starting to see more and more jobs being created in, in the southeast of the United States, the southwest of the United States, the state of Texas, in the southern states. You know, these are good places for investment. Arthur, let's talk a little bit more about what, what he just brought up, because manufacturing uh, was a hot topic for Trump. It's also a hot topic for Biden. We recently saw him go to Ohio and tout the fact that jobs are coming there. But it seems like manufacturing jobs, it takes a long time to kind of ramp that up. Is that the case, or are we already starting to see this? Yes, yeah, so I would agree with John that there is a certain degree of uh, reshoring that's going on within the manufacturers here in the United States. And if you just look at Foxconn statistics, uh, not too long ago, 44% of their production was contained in China. And today, it's about 34%. So even Foxconn and Apple are recognizing sort of the insecurity of having all their eggs in one basket and are diversifying their locations by putting plants in either Indonesia or Thailand or some other places in order to sort of overcome these supply chain shocks. And so for American companies, certainly the Biden stimulus plan and the Biden's CHIPS Act has placed a lot of money on the table for both American companies like Intel, as well as TSMC, to you know, build their facilities here in the United States. And one of the great unknowns that uh, should be mentioned is the availability of water. Uh, we're seeing all over the world water and availability of potable, fresh, drinkable water dry up everywhere around the world. Certainly, this is linked to climate change, and this is a problem that we as nations of this world face. And so whether you're talking about the Yangtze, the Rhine, or the Great Mississippi, or the Colorado, 
all these rivers are drying up and they're all drying up at the same time, which indicates there's something very, very strange going on. And the once unthinkable is now within the realm of the possible. And chip manufacturing, by the way, uses millions of gallons of ultra purified fresh water. And where they're gonna get this water, I have no idea. And that's why Intel has located their newest facility in Ohio, close to the Great Lakes, which are the world's largest sources of fresh water. Arthur, let me ask you about uh, this worst recent uh, in-person meeting between Biden and Xi. Of course, everyone starts talking about tariffs between these two countries. Do you see that easing at all in 2023? I am reservedly optimistic that these two leaders, Biden and Xi, were able to get to the bargaining table, meet each other face to face, and finally have a decent human face to face conversation. I think what they took away from this was they both established the floor. In other words, what are your red lines here? And if they can both establish the floors beyond which neither party wants to go below, then the only direction is up. And we now see Anthony Blinken as well as uh, 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 Madam Tai, you know, they're now starting to get together with their counterparts in China to have sort of back, back door as well as backstage conversations to find a way to resolve these sort of, you know, really big fault line problems that have been vexing this relationship over a number of years. So President Biden made it very clear that the first two years of his presidency would be focused on domestic policy. And then the last two years of his administration, which we have now entered, will be focused on international policy. So I dare say that I think there are brighter days ahead. And I hope and I do, I am optimistic that there will be some resolution of some of the large trade issues that have been sort of vexing uh, this relationship between the United States and China. John, we have about 20 seconds. Uh, are you just as optimistic? Is that the view from Beijing as well? Well, I'm actually not that optimistic. I think you know the 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 the, um, the purposes of the uh, going into the the summit is very different. And you know, Biden was talking about guardrails. Uh, he's insisting on competition. He's talking about you know the worst case scenario to prevent that from happening. What as President Xi is talking about developing. Uh, Sino-U.S. relations, further, you know, uh, 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 work on things of more constructive in nature. Uh, so I think the purposes are quite different. Um, but but I think one thing we can, uh, say, it's safe to say is that probably the relationship is not going to deteriorate anymore. Uh, but in terms of improvement, uh, I, I, I'm, not that, I'm not that optimistic. All right. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. I want to thank our guests for joining us. It was a great discussion. That's going to do it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for being with us. This is CGTN. China Global Television Network.